today we're out on a proper adventure. We're doing one of my favourite types of walks. The great topographical writer Gordon S. Maxwell, author of The Fringe of London, which I'm always banging on about, a big inspiration for me, published in 1925. He says there are two types of topographical rambles. One is to go in search of the scent of a clue. The other is to go out into the unknown and discover what might be. Today's walk has two of those things, so it's like a kind of jackpot, a topographical rambler's jackpot. The scent of the clue is an incredibly mysterious and intriguing one that leads us into a world of mystery. A dear friend of mine, Roxanne, sent me a photograph one evening of a church with the caption, why is there a cow on this church? And that's what we're going to go and find out today, out here on the eastern fringe of London. <laughs> it's going to be a great day. So I caught the new Elizabeth Line train from Stratford out to Romford. That's going to transform either end of London, isn't it? It's an exciting new venture when it finally all connects up. And now from Romford, we're walking, we're about to walk down Park Avenue. Of course, many of you will be thinking, well, Romford's Essex, isn't it? People always write Romford, Essex. But it is actually in the London borough of Havering. The most eastern borough. So we've got to kind of hightail it down from Romford to... I don't want to say the name of the place, because if I do, it kind of gives it away. I know some of you already know or have an idea of where I'm going. But it's about uh, two miles from Romford, so I'm going to walk there pretty quickly. We've got to meet with her at a very specific time, so it's quite different to my normal type of walk, where I'm just like meandering all over the place, taking forever to get anywhere. Um, but then from there, from this mystery location, Moat Word, it opens up a whole world of things. The list of places to go is quite immense within a short area. We've got giants on the route. We've got lots of resonant history. We've got a street of beautiful old 17th and 18th century houses. A number of um, grand residences. We've got a tithe barn, a medieval tithe barn. I mean, this walk is so rich. I, I, I just feel the excitement again, just welling up. I love it out here. London Borough Havering is one of the great London boroughs for exploration. It's also actually the London Borough which has the largest percentage of open space. I think 50%, over 50% of Havering is open space. Obviously not this. I'll link below to my walk along the, the River Rom. And you get the sense we're walking here, we're walking along a, a sort of like a high ridge, the eastern ridge of the valley of the River Rom. And of course on the other side you drop down to the valley of the Ingerborn. So this is a, a watershed between two river valleys. Or it might not be a watershed, I might be overstretching my knowledge of uh, geology and geography and anything like that really. <laughs> but uh, you, I, I think you know what I'm talking about. We've now turned on to a Roman road which adds to the mystery that we're trying to uh, unpick, unfold in front of us. Now, the cow on Roxanne's church, to me, from the photograph, looked like a bull. So the question becomes not so much why is there a cow on this church, but why is there a deeply pagan symbol on this church where there should be a cross? I have my own ideas. But knowing that if I just rushed headlong into expressing those ideas in a video, Rupert Ferguson would be there at the top of the comments pointing out my mistakes. You'll see it, just go back. Anything sort of Roman related, prehistoric related, Bronze Age, R Rupert will be in there with a ream of information. So I thought I'll get in first. And I messaged Rupert and he pointed out to me actually that the church we're going to sits on a Roman road. That's where we're walking now along this Roman road here along which were discovered a number 
of Roman burials. I think they might have been military burials and there were a number of other Roman structures along this road. I'm leading you to where we're going with the story, but you have to wait. It's up ahead. Remember, this is just the first part of today's walk. The Harrow pub here looks looks decent. It's got a nice big garden. Standard pub fare would be a good stop off point for a Roman centurion or two on the long march from London to Chelmsford. See, these are the kind of real treasures you get in the outer suburbs. This is a really intriguing. It's all right, carry on. Sorry, thank you. This is a really intriguing house, isn't it? What is that? It's some sort of arts and crafts type thing, isn't it? Sort of mock mock Elizabethan, mock Tudor, sort of medievalism, sort of thing William Morris would have loved. It's called the Foy. That is a house with a story, and I think that story will be found in the comments. And what I already like about today is that I've seen at least four or five other walkers, people with their bags on, heading out. You can tell, you can tell, you, we spot each other. And I just seen you know, a fellow on the other side of the road there. There's been, quite, <laughs> there's been quite a few, I like that. It's, it confirms what I think about the London Borough Havering. It's a place where adventures begin. It's supposed to be a place where adventures end. Harrow Lodge Park. I'm not sure if you can see that clearly, but there's a, a little river running through there, uh, which I believe is the Ravensbourne. I know there's two Ravensbournes in London, which is interesting. Um, and I've never walked along the Ravensbourne. It's a, it's a tributary of the Rom. So that is a walk we could do another day, isn't it? I think it rises up in Gidea Park and goes through Harold Lodge Park and then meets the, the River Rom. Mm. Or maybe we'll come back and do it later today. Who knows? There are options. Absolutely love buildings like this. Horn Church, Methodist Church. Looks kind of like what 30s, 40s. It's got a little bit of kind of modernism going on there, as if it could have been designed by the Bauhaus. Walter Gropius coming out and doing a church out in Havering. Who knows? So I think it's in this section of uh, Horn Church Road that some of the Roman burials and some of the roadside buildings were found, which is kind of incredible, isn't it? When you look at these roadside buildings here and there would have been buildings along this road servicing the travellers 17, 18, 1900 years ago, which is a kind of mad thought. And as we know, Roman roads often followed the lines of pre-existing trackways. So who knows, it may date back even, even further than that as a, as, a, a, as a thoroughfare, as a route. Another bit of fine interwar architecture there. 1935, that building. You gotta love any place that has a wimpy bar. Question to you, is this the only wimpy bar in London left? I don't know of any others. I only have ever seen them outside London. Younger viewers and those of you in other countries might be slightly flummoxed by my excitement to see a high street burger bar, but the wimpy bar was the original kind of British version of fast food of an American burger chain because before there were McDonald's here there was Wimpy but the difference with the Wimpy bar is you get your burger on a plate I think actually the one in Wickham you used to order from a waitress at the table they bring it my mum always liked it because you got your tea with a cup and saucer she never accepted McDonald's but she would accept a Wimpy bar unfortunately I can't get across the road to get a better shot without risking death but there's a row of very old looking buildings here on Horn Church Road. These look like, yeah, these have got some serious heritage behind them. I'll have to look it up when I get home. What Gordon S. Maxwell calls the journey in books after the day's walk. So I think that is the spire of our Bull's Head Church poking up there into the sky. Right, onwards. Wow, and just next to the church, we have this amazing timber-framed building here. What an absolute beauty. I I'm gonna speculate, I don't know how old it is. I'm gonna speculate, actually, this is an another sort of like arts and crafts type building. Could be like late Victorian or 
sort of like, you know, Edwardian. I could be completely wrong, and maybe it is really old, but it's going to be interesting. It's got a story, isn't it? This beautiful old lich gate here gives us an indicator of the age of this church. It's seriously old. So whilst I wait for, for Roxanne and her family to arrive, I'm just going to eat a, 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 a co-op sandwich, a egg and bacon sandwich. I, I kind of blew it a little bit. I did go around to check this was the right church. And it's a good job I wasn't filming because I did exclaim with a loud expletive, such was the, the reaction to what I will show you once, once Rox and her family are here. Wow is all I can say. There is Roxanne having a stroll around St Andrew's churchyard before we go to the great secret. So we are, so now I can reveal the location. I've dropped in hints, I've done a bit of foreshadowing when we passed the, the, the Horn Church food and wine. You've seen various other mentions of Horn Church on the roads. Obviously, this is where we are. Now, I'm, I haven't actually, I'll be honest with you, Roxanne's arrived and she just started filming. Hence, look, look, my hand's in the shot here and I'm close to the camera. However, I haven't actually looked at my notes yet and I make enough mistakes as it is. I've actually made some notes. I've done some research for this. I couldn't let Roxanne down. So um, I need to unpack it in a way that doesn't make you think, well, of of course there's a bull's head on that church you're in horn church of course the two things are related it is not as simple as that do you think i'd be out here on a saturday well i would be out here because i love the london borough of havering as i've been going on about so what i'm going to do is i'm going to look at the notes and then i'm going to do the reveal but maybe i should tease you a bit first with some other features on this 13th century church so we're just going around the side of the church to the rear end I, I, it's not, not called it's the north end of the church so Rox has just told me that she thought, she saw it once, she thought, do you know what, I'm not sure, I'll tell him. I'm not sure he'd be that interested. And yeah, I'm so glad she did. Because as soon as I saw that Rox's cow was in fact a horned bull, I instantly thought of the Roman god Mithras. Which Mithras was particularly popular with um, Roman soldiers. And down here, is a Roman road and of course as we know most Roman roads were military roads and as we discussed before there are a number of burials some of them possibly of military origin so the link between this Roman military road and this bull which has no right being on a church in fact this is the only bull's head on a church in the whole of the country so it's not as if oh well there's one in Northumberland there's another one in Birmingham this is the only one and I don't think we're going to get to the bottom of it not even with Roxanne's help in her wonderful biker jacket. I don't think even that can elevate this beyond the level of me waffling on, but I feel like in the comments it's gonna be full of some really good stuff. There's more, there's more. The first mention of the Horned Church, I'll put the Latin up there, but it's Monasterium Cornutium or something it dates from 1222 of there being a church at the place of the Horned Church, Horn Church. Now, a lot of people think that Horn Church takes its name from the church or vice versa, but the, the actual official history of the church and actually in the, in the Encyclopedia of London, they make no link between the fact that there is frankly a horned, a bull on this church and the name Horn Church. That feels unlikely, borderline impossible, there isn't some relationship between the name Horn Church and the horns on this church. But it's been here for quite some time, at least since the 13th century. It was always assumed that those horns there were lead, but when they, um, they took it down to be cleaned in the 17th century, they discovered that they were copper. And of course, inevitably, those copper horns were eventually lifted. Someone stole them. I don't know what they're made of now. But it is really intriguing, isn't it? This is one of the most intriguing features I think I've come across on my walk, simply because we don't know why. If you saw this in the city of London, there'd be a story behind it. But here, it's purely a mystery. So 
having a, another look at my notes, the bull's head was used as the symbol on official seals. So maybe it's possible that they put the bull's head on the church because it was on the seals, but it's really strange that they wouldn't see the inappropriacy of a bull's head. In that position, you could put it anywhere else, you could put it inside the church, but putting it on that end where there should be a cross is really strange. There's a beautiful tree here actually at the end. There's a really fine churchyard here. It's a number of really interesting burials. Obviously all the burials are quite old. This church has been here 800 years at the very least. There's evidence of settlement going back to the Mesolithic in Horn Church. You've got Mesolithic right through in the Bronze Age as well. So the Romans were just really, they just came and put like a proper road down over what was already here. And you think this site here, this hill, will have been important long before the church was built, and as we know from other places, churches are often built on the sites of pagan worship. I keep coming back to it, the bull's head on the church, come on, are they telling us? Are they trying to really go, come on guys, get the message. So Roxanne, look at this here. We've got the church door, and then just to the right of the church door is that little alcove there. That is for something, isn't it? Do you know? I don't. I, do. I think it might have been something for leaving arms, like people could leave donations for the church, or maybe the church would leave something there for the poor people, like bread or something. I feel like it's something like that. So Roxanne's pointed out what a wonderful keyhole this is, and obviously what a wonderful key would go with it. So Roxanne was wondering whether the lich gate was made from the reclaimed timbers from a ship because apparently that was something that happened and it's an intriguing idea because they are really impressive timbers. So we're now going to move on to a place where I don't know how I've not been here in a video before. In fact I've never been here before. People have been telling me about this place for the best part of many years. I mentioned here my lovely friend Nicola who lives in this area and she first told me about the next location and I can only, I have no explanation for why I've never been here but I am incredibly excited and it is, well it's no longer in view but what is in view is these amazing houses, look at this, look at this amazing row of houses here, Hill Court, probably some sort of like charitable or social housing I would have thought originally, but look at the little details there, you know, real t it displays a real care. So here, slightly overlapping with my walk along the Ingerborn, which was following the route of the London Loop. I did a couple of sections of the London Loop through here. That was a glorious walk and past Upminster Bridge Station. The zoom on my camera isn't quite um, good enough to pick out, but some of you may see what, something magnificent poking up above, above the trees. And here's the beautiful River Ingerborn which I've walked along before and I'll link to that below. That was an amazing walk, highly recommend it. It's also uh, sections, I think 22 and 23 of the London Loop, something like that. One of the most beautiful sections. So Rox has pointed out these doors here along the, on these houses. These are clearly quite old cottages here and hopefully later actually we will look at some other old cottages in the area because now we're now in Upminster and Upminster is a very, very old part of London, predates the Doomsday Book. So we're going to turn off, we're going to turn off St Mary's Lane into this magnificent field that contains this magnificent structure. This magnificent windmill was built in 1806. There was a windmill here before that, it's much older, which leads some people to believe this is an older windmill, but it's really like, you see a windmill, it is like you're seeing this magical beast. Which of course makes me think of Don Quixote, the legend of Don Quixote, the wonderful book by Cervantes, is it Cervantes? My Spanish is non-existent, so I've probably mispronounced that. But of course in Don Quixote, where there are a field of windmills, he sees a field of giants. 
And of course, he then charges at the windmill and it throws him off his horse into the air. The sails of the windmill catch hold of him. And in some ways, confirming that he was fighting against a beast. And of course, even then, when he, when he accepts that they are windmills, as Sancho Panza has been telling him, he says that sorcery has turned the giants into windmills. I really love that. Of course, what I love about the legend of Don Quixote is Don Quixote was a character who saw, who lived in a world of the imagination. He saw the world he wanted to see in his own mind, this romantic age of chivalry, which is a really beautiful idea. So when he saw wind, where other people saw windmills, he saw giants and so on and so forth. I haven't read the book. I'm sorry, <laughs> I did read a couple of summaries because there's that idea of tilting at windmills, the idea of fighting imaginary beasts. But also, I think what Don Quixote tells us is that you can see the world the way you want to see it. And it's kind of what we do on these walks, isn't it? Like we look at the landscape as it appears, but we seek to see somewhere beyond. <laughs> Corbett's Tay Road, that's a very intriguing name. What can it mean? So Upminster literally means the large church on high ground and the church they're referring to is this one here, St Lawrence's Church. I think it has some connection to Waltham Abbey. I think it maybe paid tithes to Waltham Abbey, or maybe it was land that was given to the, the abbots and the monks of Waltham Abbey, the final resting place of King Harold, of course, and featured in a number of walks. But the astonishing feature about this church here for me, you can see, this, you see that tower there behind me. It was here, there was a reverend here, Reverend William Dur Durham, Durham, Durham. And he seems to have been quite an unusual uh, kind of clergyman for his age. In the early 18th century, late 17th century, he was an avid scientist and conducted a number of scientific experiments. Not the kind of woo-woo stuff, but like proper science. He was a, uh, a fellow of the Royal Society. I think he was a kind of, uh, I don't know, a colleague of, but he would have been in the same sort of circles as Sir Isaac Newton. And it was here, from this church, uh, this church tower, that he made the first accurate recording of the speed of sound. It's incredible, isn't it? The speed of sound was first recorded here from this church tower. Just let that sink in a moment. Apparently, what he, uh, the method he used is he used a telescope from the church tower to observe uh, someone firing a, a, gu a gun, a shotgun, in a field, in a nearby field. And somehow, from the flash of the gun to the sound reaching him, that is how he calculated the speed of sound. It's amazing. So for those of you that are more mystically minded, I'm thinking Rupert already teed up. We have, we have the Bull's Head Church and the kind of echoes of Mithras and the Roman legions and the burials along the road. And here we have a member of the Royal Society, which a lot of people link to, consp sort of, not conspiracies, but great mysteries of the past. If you're a fan of the Ben Aronovich Rivers of London books, which I'm sure many of you are, and if you're not, you need to get into them. Of course, he has uh, Sir Isaac Newton being the founder of modern magic, sort of scientific magic. <laughs> the, the police officers, the magic police, are called the Isaacs, that's their nickname. So there's all sorts of stuff connecting here. It's something you know, you can make, if you're the psychogeographers in you, uh, Ian Sinclair, I would say, would have an absolute field day with some of the things here, and we're only halfway through. Station Road, Upminster, is a really fine street, isn't it? There's some really interesting buildings along here. I have been here before. I started an epic walk here out to uh, London Gateway out near Stamford La Hope. That was a few years ago now, about a good five years ago. Horn Church and Upminster is a land of the unexpected. And just off Station Road down St Lawrence Road here is another really quite incredible unexpected feature. This shows, <laughs> shows how reliable like Apple Maps can be somewhere. Apple Maps has the place I'm going to. I'll tell you now, it's a, it's a tithe barn. It's a it's a 800 year old, I think at least 800 year old tithe barn. Um, but it's not here. It's it's not in this street at all. It's further up the street. I was already walking up. So, you know, these things happen on a walk. Now my local guide has departed. Roxanne has gone off. You know, I'm wandering free, drifting, and all sorts of things could happen. Who knows? Maybe I'll end up going to attack the windmill. It's 
going along Hall Lane now, up Minster. So although we're right over on the eastern edge of London, literally the border of Greater London is just a little bit over there, maybe a mile or two. We're only about 16 and a half miles from Charing Cross, which is where the measurements for the centre of London are made. So if you think about that, 16 miles, I know as a walk, I mean, you can walk that in, I don't know, about what, five, six hours? But I, I love these borderland territories. They're so, I don't know, they have a special feel. I think we learn a lot about the city from going to its edges, from its fringes, more than you do from being at the centre. And here it is, the magnificent Upminster Tithe Barn. It's incredible structure. It dates from 1450. They performed a dendrochronology on some of the timbers. Dendrochronology is the process by which you can age wood and timber. I remember as a kid they did that on uh, the Mary Rose when they raised the Mary Rose. It's got this fantastic thatched roof. It's um, associated with Upminster Hall, which is an estate which goes back to at least the, the 1060s when Earl Harold, later King Harold, uh, gave this land here to Waltham Abbey. And it now houses the quite wonderfully named Museum of Nostalgia, which has an incredible collection of objects that date from the Roman period up to the modern day. Unfortunately for me, it's actually closed today. It only opens on selected weekends. So I think what we'll do now is we go back down into the valley of the Ingrebourne, cross the river and then go back through Hornchurch to Romford. A couple of places in Hornchurch I'd quite like to have a look at. And here is the Ingrebourne again. I'll link below, as I've mentioned before, to the walk I did along here, along the London Loop. It was a really beautiful walk. And I really enjoyed this particular section. So we're going to walk around the edge of this field and then through the houses on the other side to the final Desta, the final sites, locations on this really quite magical walk today. So in a day of anachronisms and anomalies, here's another one. Look at this little single track railway here and somebody told me that this is the shortest section of the London Overground and it's a line that runs from Romford through Emerson Park to Upminster. It's just three stops, Upminster, Emerson Park, Upminster. But of course Romford and Upminster on other lines, Emerson Park just exists in this little single track railway line here. And there are a number of um, level crossings as well. They're not, I don't know if they can't be you know, for pedestrians to cross the railway. I'm not sure how frequent the service is. And here it is, the little crossing across the, across the railway line. These things are quite rare in London, and obviously, you know, to be treated with extreme caution. So we'll cut across St Andrew's Park, which is a nice back reference to the church near the beginning of this walk. And that takes us up to the High Street, or I think it's called North Street actually. So here's a fascinating little fact on the, uh, on the park information board here. It says, look, the railway cutting adjacent to St Andrew's Park, which is the one we just saw, is one of the most important Ice Age sites in Britain. It's the type, uh, it is the type site of Hornchurch Till, a deposit of boulder clay laid down by a glacier or lobe of ice from the Anglian ice sheet in the Ingleborn Valley about 450,000 years ago and marking the maximum subtle extent of the ice sheet during the whole of the Ice Age. That's incredible. Here we have the kind of civic heart of Hornchurch. We have the library on one side of the road, I'm facing it. We've got the, uh, the Queen's Theatre, which looks like a very sort of modern building. I think it's like a 300 seat theatre. We don't have one like this in Waltham Forest, so you're very lucky, people of Hornchurch. Now here is the wonderful Fair Tykes Hall, an 18th century manor house, mansion, maybe not a manor house, but a mansion, a very fine residence. 
and amongst its former occupants is uh, Joseph Fry, brother of the famous prison reformer Elizabeth Fry, very notable Quaker families. I think, uh, was it Fry's Peppermint Cream? That's them, it's sort of um, involved in confectionery and all sorts of things. And of course, all those famous Quaker families, like the Buxtons kind of intermarried and you have Barclays Bank and all sorts of things going on. I'm sort of slightly obsessed with the Buxton family and uh, the Buxtons and the Fries and the Gurneys were all connected. So all manner of interesting conversations would have taken place in the drawing room at Fair Tykes Hall, now an art centre. Right, one more place to find, just off Billet Lane here, and that will be the end of the walk. Can I find it? Is it accessible? Let's find out. And here is the entrance to Langton's house, which will be a fine conclusion to our walk. I mean, I haven't seen it yet, but I, it looks like it will be. Now, isn't this beautiful? You wouldn't necessarily know it was here from the, from the main road, but this is Langton's house, which is a grade two listed 18th century house. Very grand it is indeed. And the grounds were laid out by Humphrey Repton, a famous landscape gardener who's left his mark all around London including uh, at Hyams Park, which is not a million miles away from here. Isn't it a majestic building? It's now like a wedding and events venue. Among the former residents were a captain of the East India Company, associated with uh, Blackwall Docks. There's also a Huguenot family lived here and a family of famous brewers. I say famous, I can't think of the name of the brewery. It just said famous on the information board there. So I'll take that at face value. Well, the London Borough of Havering is really delivered once again, particularly like Hornchurch and Upminster. I mean, I think we've probably, I wouldn't say we've just scratched the surface because I know I've shot a lot of footage <laughs> today and a lot of that's me waffling on, but there's so much to see here, just this relatively small area. Um, thank you so much to Roxanne for, for, for leading me out here on this adventure to look at the cow on the church, the bull's head church. I think there's gonna be some good comments on this video. I'm pretty confident of that. And that was, I don't know, I mean, we didn't solve the mystery. I mean, how could we? But we've certainly started the inquiry in this video. So thank you for joining me on this incredible walk. I've loved this walk. And of course, this is the start of season four of the year, the, the next sort of block of six videos. So I'm just going to stroll up the road now to Gidea Park and get the Elizabeth line once again. Now it's up and running at long, 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 long last. How long has it taken? Ten years to get that up and running? Time to sign off, time to say goodbye. And as I always like to say, I look forward to seeing you on the next walk, wherever that may be. And I, I, I have no more idea than I usually do. In fact, I have less idea than I usually do. Mm -hmm.